Well, I think you all know me, Jen Sperkman, from the King Team. There's a few new people here. But uh, it's my pleasure tonight to introduce Jeffrey Chia, who's a uh, Brisbane cardiologist and convener of Doctors and Scientists for Sustainability and Social Justice. Um, Jeffrey's had a long standing interest in uh, energy issues and particularly petroleum. And he's written numerous articles on petroleum addiction and petroleum politics. So um, his talk tonight is called Taking the Red Bill. And uh, I'm sure that we'll all enjoy it. He gave me permission to commence with the topic which uh, the Department of Kindness is close to his heart. Um, so just a little bit about um, coronary artery disease, which is the biggest killer in the Western world. In America, um, a population of just under 300 million, about 1.1 million heart attacks occur every year, of which about 460,000 are fatal. What are heart attacks due to? Well, what happens is there's a buildup of cholesterol in the coronary artery, which supplies the heart muscle with blood. And then one fine day, for whatever reason, a surge in blood pressure, uh, the clot ruptures and a clot forms on it. And it's the clot which occludes the artery. Now, if it occludes far downstream, then only a small portion of the heart muscle is threatened, the risk of death is low. If it occludes far upstream, there's a large portion of the heart muscle which dies, and the risk of death is high. So I'm just going to start with a few coronary angiograms. Um, so here's um, one I did on a patient uh, about three weeks ago. And this is a um, basically a normal study. I just wanted to show you what a normal study looks like. Now, I'm just going to focus on the left coronary system. There is a right coronary artery that only supplies back to about a quarter of the left ventricular myocardium. Um, now, the two main arteries in the left system are the left anterior descending artery here and the circumflex artery here, which arise from what we call the left main stem. So everything looks pretty normal here. Now we'll go on to another angiogram I did in a patient uh, a couple of weeks ago. And so this guy was getting a lot of um, angina. And um, so this is a slightly different view. The circumflex is up in the skylight view, and the left anterior descending system is low. This is the left anterior descending artery here. Uh, and this is the circumflex, uh, sorry, this is a diagonal branch here. And you can see pretty obviously the two critical tendon lesions in the left anterior descending artery. Um, so this is a um, moderately uh, bad situation, um, but uh, possibly not that life-threatening as David Hood's um, condition. He had what's called the proximal LED lesion, or um, in colloquial terms, the widowmaker. And um, you can imagine if that vessel occludes there, you, you would lose a huge portion of his myocardium. So David was wise enough to take the red pill to face reality um, and had bypass surgery. Um, and he's done very well, and we expect another at least 20 good years of quality life and um, environmental activism from him. Now, is there anything more serious than the Widowmaker lesion? Well, there is. And what's worse is the left main stem lesion. So there's a severe lesion here which feeds um, both the left anterior descending artery and the circumflex artery. Now, if that occludes, there is no hope of survival. This patient will die. This patient literally hanging by a thread. Um, and um, there's no real option here. They need immediate surgery. I don't know if there's a colloquial term for this kind of lesion. I call it a brown pants case. <laughs> now, what does this all got to do with the price of fish? A few points I want to make. Firstly, you are not being alarmist if you are telling the truth. Secondly, if a situation is dire, it is essential to tell the truth so that measures can be taken to prevent death. Thirdly, if a situation is dire, it is the delusional, hubristic optimists who are irresponsible and dangerous. Okay, now to the main topic. Question. 
Black shoots out of the ground and shouts bollocks. Answer, crude oil. If you think it's a terrible joke, the bad news is it just gets worse. Thomas Hobbes said, in ages past, the life of man is nasty, brutish, short, and poor. We have the extreme good fortune to be born into these modern times where we have science and technology which enables us to harness the extreme benefits of fossil fuels, in particular petroleum. And uh, we live lives of luxury which were unimaginable to the generations past. But as you can see, fossil fuels are a limited resource. So what's going to happen when we run out of them? Are we going to go back to lives which are nasty, brutish, short and poor? Or can we, as a so-called sapient species, transition to a sustainable future? Who knows? I, for one, am somewhat pessimistic. It's kind of Faustian pact we have entered into. But one fine day, the day of reckoning will come, and the devil will have his due. We are utterly dependent on petroleum for our modern lifestyles in every way, shape, and form. 95% of all our transportation is utterly dependent on petroleum. Shipping, planes, road transport. Out of a single barrel of oil, about 70% goes to transportation. The rest uh, of almost equal economic value um, it goes to various other processes, principally the petrochemical industry, manufacturing of plastics, uh, petrochemicals, um, uh, even the um, pharmaceutical industry. I'd like to focus on two particular sectors uh, which are of vital importance to us um, and certainly to politicians and those who govern our countries. The first one is the military. The modern military machine runs on petroleum. It is an indispensable um, ingredient uh, for it to operate. If you think about those uh, wonderful looking uh, supersonic planes which run around, which fly around at Mark III, bristling with weaponry and electronics, without petroleum, they're nothing more than glorified paperweights. Let's talk about agriculture because this is a key issue to us and it's what um, concerns us the most really. Um, it would not be possible for us to support 6.8 billion people around the world these days were it not for the use of fossil fuels, especially petroleum. Those tractors, those combined harvesters, those crop dusting planes, those trains and trucks which um, deliver food to our cities are all run on petroleum. But more than that, our fertilizers are made from petroleum. Pesticides and herbicides, well, fertilizers are made primarily from natural gas to but herbicides and pesticides are made from petroleum. So there's no way we could maintain this mass scale industrial type agriculture we have today without the use of fossil fuels. So this brings me to the story of Fritz Haber. Fritz Haber is described as the father of modern German chemistry. He won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1918. It was a controversial award because he was heavily involved in the um, chlorine um, gassing of soldiers in World War I, developing the chlorine as a weapon of mass destruction. So at one point, the Nobel Prize committee actually threatened to take his Nobel Prize away from him until he reminded them that Alfred Nobel himself made his fortune from dynamite and was a merchant of death. So after pointing that piece of hypocrisy to them, they relented and let him keep his prize. There are a few ironies about Fritz Haber's life. He was actually quite reviled in many ways um, because of his, his involvement in the, uh, uh, technical, the technological development of, of mass murder. We use his name in the Haber Bosch process, uh, which is known as a means of extracting atmospheric nitrogen to manufacture ammonium com compounds using fossil fuels. And it was a revolutionary process. It was principally developed so that uh, Germany could be free of um, uh, potassium nitrate imports from Chile at the time. And they obviously used it for manufacturing of explosives in World War II. Um, and his uh, other chemical processes were used to manufacture nerve gases 
more advanced in glory um, to, to guests of millions of people in World War II as well. So what, what were the ironies of Heber's um, life? Um, he was actually revived to such an extent that uh, when he visited Cambridge, the great uh, physicist Ernest Rutherford refused to shake his hand. Um, Bruce Heber's wife, Clara, was also a chemist, and they used to have these knocked out, dragged out arguments about his involvement in war crimes. To the extent that one fine day she um, was so upset she actually uh, took a gun and shot herself in the heart and killed herself. His son also killed himself um, some years later due to his extreme shame um, of his father. That's one irony. The other irony is that Fritz Hegel was a Jew, a Hasidic Jew, who tried very hard to hide his background. He wanted very much to be accepted by the mainstream German establishment, but he never was. Uh, he was used as, a, as an instrument by them but was still reviled as a Jew. The third irony is this. Using Haber's chemical processes, the IG Farben company in World War II developed a nerve gas called Zyklon B, with which they gassed millions of Jews. Many among them were, or a number of among them were Fritz Haber's own relatives. The fourth irony is this. Even though his Haber wash process was used for initially as a method for manufacturing explosives. Um, ultimately, we use it now for the manufacture of fertilizers. Um, and it is this more than anything else in our history which has enabled us to avert a Malthusian catastrophe. What lessons do we take from this? I don't know, I'm just stating the historical facts to you. You can decide if there's any moral to this story. Let's go to the geologic history of petroleum. <laughs> Before I start on that, I'd like to disavow you of any crazy ideas you might have that um, oil is not of biological origin. There were a few Russian scientists in the 1970s who said abiotic oil um, it, it comes from natural geologic processes. Look at Titan, the moon, the, the Saturn of um, uh, the, the satellite of Saturn, uh, which is bathed in seas of methane and methane. So surely hydrocarbons in the Earth's crust can be derived by natural geologic processes. Well, that's pure rubbish. We know it is of biological origin for three main reasons. Firstly, the ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-13 is characteristic of um, biological origin. Secondly, and this is the clincher, there are complex molecules, molecular signatures, if you will, which are found in petroleum, which betray their origins. Uh, porphyrins, porphyrins are four golden molecules with a metallic multi in the center. Um, we have hemoglobin as, as a porphyrin with iron in the center. Plants have uh, magnesium in the center, that's chlorophyll. And we can identify from these molecular signatures not only that petroleum came primarily from plants, but they came from plankton, and not just plankton, not freshwater plankton, they came from marine plankton. There's no doubt whatsoever. The third reason we know it's of biological origin is because oil is found exactly where we would expect it to be. It came from marine plankton. 